Our next speaker uh, today is Ola Madsen, and I've probably had more trouble figuring out how to introduce Ola than I have with anybody in this room, um, or any of the speakers, I mean. Um, I, uh, Sabina and I met Ola and Grace when we uh, moved to Boston, and uh, Ola and his wife Grace were very helpful to us in finding a place for us to live and um, we were renting and when about a year later we decided and they lived in the same area same neighborhood um, about a year later we decided to buy a house and maybe a couple of years after that uh, grace and Ola moved out of town uh, because of the immigrants uh, that were invading their neighborhood uh, specifically immigrants from Australia. Uh, Ola also used to drive me to MIT when I first arrived here and, and I was incessantly yawning in the morning uh, because as some, of, in the afternoon. <laughs> as, some of, as some of you who were early students at MIT when I was there uh, you may have realized that I was preparing. I had, we had a a new baby. Rebecca was born in, in January and I had to start teaching in February. And so, you know, we had a th three week old and uh, I was going to bed early uh, and getting up very early to prepare classes for that day. Um, so I know some of you in this room suffered, suffered from that. Uh, and I, apolo I apologize for, for that, but Ola is also one that helps, helps me learn to teach. Uh, my, my early teaching evaluations weren't great, and uh, Ola took it upon himself to sit in and uh, give me some pointers on how to improve my teaching, so I'm, uh, I'm ever grateful for that. The other, the other thing that we shared, uh, along with Pete Eagleson, who was just down the corridor, was we, we all had... Um, well, sketchy senses of humor, I think, is probably the closest, <laughs> closest way to describe it. And very, very often the day at MIT for me would start with a cup of coffee in Ola's office, and at some point we'd have to close the door because the conversation had, had wasn't politically correct. Uh, and uh, you know, Peter Eagleson would either, would either join us or tell us to be quiet. Uh, so. <coughs> We've, we've known each other since that time, and uh, I, think, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, we are very good friends. I hope I can say that. Um, and uh, we've helped each other out uh, during times of crisis in our lives, so um, that pretty much sealed the deal for me. So it's, uh, it's with a, you know, a great deal of pleasure that uh, I introduce Ola Madsen, my friend and colleague from MIT. Well, I was going to call this talk uh, WCs. Uh, it's performance uh, and uh, the facility in some resources, but actually Fabrice was the one who recommended that I write it out in full so that you didn't get any wrong impression. Of, uh, uh, and as Ken said, uh, we have known each other for more than half of your lifetime. Yes, it's 36. Uh, and, uh, one thing that I learned from Ken, and that's why I have, I'm giving this talk, was I saw him at MIT do, that was in your primary lab experiment days, I saw the care and absolute meticulous approach to experimental uh, investigations in the lab, because you go to the lab because you presumably have control. And very often you see people go into the lab and not exercise the control that they have, which generally makes the results rather worthless. And uh, therefore, I think that Ken influenced me and uh, made me uh, think about trying to become a good experimentalist. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the issue is... Uh, related to physics, is related to beach erosion and uh, 
uh, change of floor lines and uh, God is good to us during the summer, generally, we have a beach and during the winter, you don't know what winter is here but on the Cape Cod, during the winter uh, when you don't really care whether you have a beach or not, it ain't there. <laughs> so uh, this shifting back and forth, uh, we believe is uh, to a large extent due to a cross or sediment transport rate, not just what the Corps of Engineers would like you to believe, which is a longshore transport rate, it's the cross shore. And that is the terrible problem of a small difference between two large numbers, so if you're going to try to predict it, you need to have a very good prediction of each of the large numbers because you're talking about the 5% difference, and that may very well come out with the wrong sign. So, secondary processes, wave nonlinearity, superimposed currents, and bottom slope. Bottom slope is actually what I'm going to talk about most today. Uh, the key to, or the keys to these problems are the boundary layer hydrodynamics and uh, bottom shear stress, because the bottom shear stress is the one that acts on the sediment grains. I'm not going to go cohesive. Uh, sand is tough enough, and that's what makes things move, not energy dissipation. So this is a feature of, uh, I used to call it the monster, when it, now it's behaving, so now it's the million dollar baby. Uh, but it is a, a water wave current sediment facility. This is what it looks like. It's a, essentially a huge closed tunnel with two open risers at each end. And in one riser, there is a piston that can be programmed to move any way you want it. Uh, the limits are that uh, the velocity that is given up here, two meters per second, is prototype scale velocity. It's not the velocity of the piston, it's four times the velocity because it's the velocity in the test channel, which is uh, four times or four times as small in the area. Uh, and periods and uh, uh, accelerations and the maximum amplitude is of the excursion in the actual facility, which is 10 meters long. Uh, is the two meters. Uh, everything is transparent uh, lids, which makes it easy to look down rather than having steel plates that take four days to remove and they rust if you don't make them in stainless steel. Uh, the last viewing windows, it makes easy uh, PIV uh, application to measure velocity. The entire flume is supported on a pivot and jacks at the other end, so that the entire thing that weighs uh, full of water, around nine tons, can be flipped at an angle. And uh, uh, we just heard about the minus one to three degrees. We can go from zero to 2.6 degrees, so uh, it's about the same thing. Uh, and through flexible connections at the ends, we have a rotary uh, pump at the bottom uh, that will generate a current. You can flip the switch and it will generate a current and go the <coughs> other way. And it uh, has the ability to generate between 60 plus minus 60 centimeters per second current. And I believe this is the only facility where you can do simulate wave motions with a superimposed current on a slope. The whole and then sediment on the bottom, of course. So the uh, According to Ken's uh, uh, example, you want to know what you're getting. So here's the forward leaning wave and the Stokes wave uh, with the actual feedback and the signal that we sent into the piston motion. And you can see it's pretty good agreement. Uh, and the competition, Aberdeen and Delft, you can see that uh, not quite. So. <laughs> I can excuse there's nobody from Aberdeen and, uh, and Delft here. Uh, to see what we are getting, obviously, we use the PIV to measure the actual velocities where we want them. And this is a Stokes second order wave, and uh, it has a first harmonic, a second harmonic, and a phase difference that should be uh, zero, or any multiple of two pi. And you can see PIV is actually measured the other one is predicted from the piston motion. That's the amplitude of the first harmonic, the amplitude of the second harmonic, and the phase angle is five degrees off uh, instead of 360. So we 
know what we are getting. We have excellent repeatability and we get what we put in also in the test channel, which is very helpful because we never have to measure it again. We know if we put this in, that's what we are getting. So hydrodynamic studies, solving the equation, with blue being a wave and green being a current. And we have modeled that uh, in, uh, with a simple theory, with an eddy viscosity that is time varying. The main thing is the big F of T at the end. And just to give you a feel for what that might be, uh, we have time varying eddy viscosity. If we have a sinusoidal wave, obviously the eddy viscosity would be scaled by the absolute value, which would be something that looks like this which consists of a mean and a second harmonic so that you get a representation that looks something like that of the actual time varying eddy viscosity. That means that there is a mean value and a second harmonic. So when you put that into the governing equation, you will get a term that is a second harmonic eddy viscosity multiplied by a, a first order uh, a, a, a first harmonic velocity. That means you will get third harmonic shear stresses and third harmonic velocities. When you have a sinusoidal wave, it will produce something of third harmonic. If you go to a Stokes wave, a nonlinear wave, there's a difference between the peak, the top, and the bottom. Well, other than that, it's still the same. You get a mean and a second harmonic, but now you need to take care of the difference between the crest that is too high and the trough that is too low, which calls for a first harmonic. Just a simple first harmonic and you end up with this kind of a representation of the uh, velocity of the eddy viscosity. You put that into the equation and you will end up with the first harmonic variation. Therefore, you get a first harmonic eddy viscosity multiplied by a first harmonic velocity, and that is going to have a time average different from zero. So the conclusion is, but if you have nonlinear waves uh, or sinusoidal waves with a current, because the current is going to go in one way or the other, so it's going to increase one uh, shear stress and decrease the other shear stress under the trough. Consequently, a combination like that will create a steady stream. And uh, let's first look at the results for sinusoidal waves. Uh, the bottom shear stress, as you can see here, is. Uh, definitely the blue pot dots, that's the variation of bottom shear stress is very well represented by a first and a third harmonic, as I said. A shear stress of a third harmonic would appear. <coughs> and the, the shear stresses, obviously, we obtain them from, uh, uh, from fitting the bottommost PIV uh, profile to a log layer. And on to the left here, you see a sine, a sine wave with a current, the current velocity is logarithmic inside the wave boundary layer but of a different slope because the eddy viscosity is different uh, in the wave boundary layer. The wave contributes and the wave boundary layer, as you can see there, is uh, also a very nice log profile and that's the way we get the bottom shear stresses from the start and the bottom roughness. And the currents experienced uh, uh, or experience enhanced bottom roughness uh, when waves are present. So you know, there's more resistance, and that's indicated by Z0 is the actual bottom roughness, would be diameter of sand or something like that, and Z0 A is an apparent roughness that's a lot bigger. And I think that I think I would like to speak to Jim about your profiles that also deviate from what you get from further out. I'm not sure. Uh, whether well, this is applicable there, but it might be. So this is what was also predicted in an old model by Bill Grant and myself in 1973. Uh, and what we found out was, remember I said, when you have a sinusoidal wave and a current, the current uh, will interact with the wave, and then you get this first harmonic eddy viscosity that will introduce a streaming. So you now have a current and a streaming and they together will give you a number of their variation that looks like this. And this is an excellent agreement for this particular case with numerical results uh, by Davis uh, from 1988. And the thing is that when uh, Bill and I did it, we did not realize that there was the existence of a streaming induced by the wave uh, 
uh, turbulence uh, induced uh, streaming, and we use the two lines of eddy viscosity actually, which automatically will remove or move the velocity <coughs> down. And we call it the current, but it is not the current. The current is the green guy, and the streaming added, which is negative added to the current, gives you the mean flow, and that's the one we predicted beautifully by the lock. Unfortunately, the lock, the lock ran, ran out when we started talking about waves and currents in different directions, but uh, that's not the point here, because obviously one of the limitations of this particular facility is the fact that it's only co-directional. Uh, here are results of our model predictions and observations for a Stokes wave with a superimposed current. One is plus 60 centimeters, the other one is minus 60 centimeters, and the other one in the middle is just a Stokes wave, uh, wave-induced current. Uh, if you look at the two velocity profiles to the left and to the right, they look just the same, right? The one is minus 60, the other one is plus 60. Uh, which corresponds to the fact we are superimposing the same velocity. However, when you look at the shear stresses on the bottom, in particular, when you look at the average, you see this one over here, and that might come in handy here. This one has an average <coughs> shear stress, which would be the current shear stress, of some 60 centimeters squared per second, whereas the other one where the current is against the nonlinear wave uh, uh, is only minus 32, and there's a difference of two. And that is because as you add a current to a Stokes wave, when the current is in the same direction as the, call it the crest of the Stokes wave, then you add a shear stress on top of where the shear stress is already big, which means the first harmonic is going to get bigger, and therefore the uh, return or the uh, wave induced streaming is going to get larger and it works in the opposite direction of the current. So here, remember our little rotary pump at the bottom that works just like the, uh, the rapid energizer. It just keeps on going. It just maintains. No matter what the pressure difference is, it will continue to make a 60 centimeter uh, current. So if there's something else that moves it in that direction, posting it, then the flow would simply have to get that much bigger. It continues to circulate 60 centimeters per second through the system. And that is, uh, the nature of that is, to the left is uh, what we see for a plus uh, 60 centimeter current, the uh, wave boundary layer, retardation, and then the uh, speeding up as it starts to get smaller. These are the experiments, this is the current, this is the mean flow. Over to the right, you just have the, the red line, which is this one here, at a slightly different scale. But because this is an analytical theory, we can actually resolve well, how much is the streaming and how much is the actual current, because we can simply turn, turn, off, uh, turn them off. So we can see that the contribution of the streaming is in a negative direction, which is always B. And it is quite large. It gets all the way up to minus 50 centimeters. Remember, I'm imposing a 60 centimeter per second velocity. So the current that I'm actually producing, in this case here, is more than 100 centimeters per second to satisfy the fact that the pump is telling me you've got to move 60 centimeters per second through the system. Whereas when you go to the minus 60. Minus 60 means that you are increasing the shear stress in the negative direction where a Stokes wave has a small shear stress. So they become more the same. First harmonic is much smaller and consequently. <coughs> the wave induced stream is nearly zero for this particular case, and therefore the current and the resulting sum of the two, the mean flow. Uh, are needed the same. So this is a very important thing to be able to say that because if you just looked at the velocity profile, you would think that, oh, it's just a reverse of the current. And then you would say that the average shear stress would be the same whether I had negative current or a positive current. That's not the case, and that would be very dangerous if you were going to interpret uh, sediment transport results using that. So let's go through the sediment transport. Uh, sheet flow conditions, uh, 
uh, from the side it looks something like this. You know, it's just, it is a very strong wave condition. It's the kind of wave condition that you have generally in the inner surf zone. You walk out on the beach and it's nice and plain, and then you walk up and then you start, these little things start coming up on the bottom ripples and irritate the underside of your foot. Uh, these uh, these uh, sea flow conditions are very strong and it, they use the shield parameter uh, that is about 1.0, which should give us the sheet flow condition. And in order to make sense out of that, of course, it's nice to look at it, but you want to determine what is the net transport rate. And in order to be able to take a net transport rate from these experiments, we need to be able to measure the bottom profile, in particular, the change. If we run 50 waves over that bottom profile, how much sediment disappeared? What is the transport? So we designed a uh, uh, laser-based bottom profile system uh, where you have laser units up here, actually two rows of 12 lasers that each create a sheet and we get two lines on the bottom. On the side, we have cameras that will take pictures of these lines, correct them for, uh, for refraction, etc. We can then get the elevation differences. Uh, and the whole thing, this camera beam, is supported at a pivot at the same place where the tank is pivoted so that everything can be tilted in unison. Uh, and, uh, we did some preliminary experiments uh, where we had uh, we, a known geometry and we also measured the same bottom twice and obviously the difference in uh, elevation should be zero. As you can see from this, the uh, standard deviation of the measurement, these are six cameras uh, put together and uh, the standard deviation is of the order of 0.1 millimeter which is the size of the sediment uh, on the bottom. So basically we can get the line there with the same accuracy as you would expect to get it uh, with actual knowledge of where the bottom exactly is. I have until 4.30, is that right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, that, that means I have to subtract to figure out how no, much no, no. time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, in order to get the transport, we use the sediment conservation principle. That is, that the rate of, uh, or the gradient of the transport, if more goes out and comes in, the bottom is going to disappear. And so this is the equation. We can integrate that from the, from the downstream end, from x0, and to any point here, and, uh, v0 is the uh, amount of volume sediment that was thrown out of our experimental range. So we can collect that and then we can calculate a sediment transport rate by integrating the continuity equation, epsilon is the velocity of the sand. And we can also integrate from the other end where we have collected an amount of VDL and go backwards and it gives us this, this equation here. So obviously, uh, we would like for the two results to be the same because otherwise we have to make a choice. And I'll get to that shortly, but assume for the moment that the two results are the same. And you would then expect to have some weird stuff going on right here. Because close to the end, the sediment transport is not the sediment transport that you have when you are among your friends, that is among other sediment grains. There is a an, an boundary to it which can affect the flow disturb it, and the sediment transport rate that you get here is the sediment transport rate close to a particular uh, barrier. So there will be some end effects, but we expect those end effects to disappear and only extend one to two times the amplitude of the waves into the, uh, into the actual test section, and the same thing up here on the other end. So you expect to get a weird transport rate here and then a constant in the middle because the conditions are completely uniform. There should be no difference between uh, transport and, and any X, so you expect to get that. And then you can say that you get from that the net sediment transport rate <coughs> the average mm -hmm. over this middle section. Well, if we take the difference between the calculation of sediment trans <coughs> transport from the downstream end and from the upstream end, 
we end up with this expression here. The, the difference is related to the volume of sediment that according to our uh, measurements, the delta Z integrated over the length from X0 to XL. That is the measured volume of loss from the test section. And V0 and VL were the amounts that we collected at the end. Well, to conserve total amount of sediment in the tank, and the lids are fairly good, sometimes it squirts a little water, but the sediment stays in the tank. This would be, uh, obviously, V2. Whatever I collect outside should be exactly what I lost inside. And if that's the case, then I have a satisfaction of what a global continuity or conservation of sand, and this should be equal to zero, and consequently QSD, whether I calculate from the downstream or the upstream, it should be immaterial. However, invariably we find that we have more sand disappearing from the measurement section than we have collected outside. <laughs> uh, now, of course, the first thing you do, you accuse the student who did have to get the lids off uh, the, the tank and get down there and uh, collect sand. Because obviously, in order to get this one to be zero, since it's bigger than zero, listen, you, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to be accused of saying something wrong, uh, you didn't do a good job. You left a hell of a lot of sand in there. You, uh, because this is too low. Well, uh, first of all, if we say that, then the two ends of the, of the flume are virtually identical. So if he made an error up there, he made the same error down here. So we can divide that error in measurements into uh, contributing and V0 and VL are both small by that amount. And then we get a corrected V0 and VL that is the measure plus the delta V over 2 because it's the same in both ends. And we get the variation of sediment transport. Now it's the same whether we go left or right, and this is what it looks like. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, you expect physically that the transport rate in the center portion is constant. This is not quite constant. It looks like a slope. So there's an alternative way of explaining why this quantity here is not zero. Well, anyway, B L B P, the volume is not the same. And that could be that the entire area or the entire volume of sand is loosely put into the flume by the action near the surface of water moving or sediment transport and sheet flow about a centimeter of sediment moving it could set it. Or the pressure gradient inside the flow, inside the bottom, could actually consolidate the sediment just a little bit. So let's try that one. You know, no more complaint about the student not collecting the right amount. And you can see when you correct <coughs> Uh, anyway, you correct it by that settlement means that you actually thought that the bottom went down further than it really did because of loss of sediment rather than it. And you get the red line. And the red line is very easy because it's approximately giving you a constant transport rate in the center portion, so it physically is more uh, appealing than the other correction. Instead, if you can prove that the two result it should be the exact same result when you go to the midpoint. Uh, it takes over uh, L over 2. Uh, but we can take an average and we get in this particular experiment, we get a transport rate of 4.6 times 10 to the minus 6 square meters per second with an accuracy of 10, 10 to the minus 6 square meters per second. This doesn't tell you very much. But it's always nice to get a physical feel for how much that is. You line up people with a shovel per meter. There's one person for every one meter. And you have that person take a shovel full and throw it over the line once every hour. That's this transport rate. So it ain't very much. It's going to take a lot of people a long time to erode the beach. Uh, but this is also for a case that is 
But that's basically the accuracy of our measurements uh, on the transport. So if we are using sinusoidal waves and have no bottom slope, then it's complete symmetry and there will be no net transport. Whatever moves to the left comes back going to the right, so there's no net transport. So we want to look at slope-induced net transport for sinusoidal waves. It's, again, it is taking an ideal example where you remove all the other small effects and just keep the slope. And the Q, uh, the slope is like shown over there, and we get the, the, the non-dimensional sediment transport rate, so there's no difference because it's all for the same sediment, uh, varies linearly the slope. And you know, any kind, any kind of simple argument that, uh, that the transport is a function of slope, and then you see people do a Taylor expansion around zero slope, where it is zero, and the linear, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, term in the Taylor expansion would be a linear variation. And it's not, well, that would be true if the sediment transport varied with the uh, with cube of the, or the, the, the square of the slope. So this at least verifies that we get that kind of uh, linear relationship that's right now is under review of all of the stuff I've talked about about uh, uh, sediment transport by uh, uh, procedural conditions. And this is an example of uh, comparison. I want you to know sediment transport is known for keeping people that produce log log paper alive. <laughs> uh, I have seen several log logs today. I'm glad. You know, this is linear. It's not log log. These are our 30 experiments for different slopes, for different wave conditions, for different stuff. And this is the prediction, uh, uh, the measurement and the prediction of the model. And these are the points. All of them are within a factor. I guess not. Nearly all of them are within a factor of two, except the small ones that are so small they don't give a damn. So, uh, which is in the field of sediment transport is not bad. Uh, the best fit line is the dash line here, has a slope of 1.03 and 95% confidence of 0.2. So that's pretty good. It gets even better when you consider the fact that our predicted model is a model that consists of two points, two parts, bed load and the suspended load transport. And they are predicted. No single parameter needs to be changed to fit the data. So no, it is truly a predictive model. In the future, of course, we need to apply this to other kind of waveforms like net transport by nonlinear waves and all that. But for slope, it seems to work very well. And again, I want to just show this competition. It's the same type of uh, comparison, basic transport rate, the big transport rate, perfect agreement, factor two. Uh, the difference here, is uh, the prediction is based on the empirical formula that has been obtained by fitting the data. I don't know enough about a lot of other fields, but I know this unfortunately is a very typical thing in sediment transport, that you compare your formula against the data you use to develop it. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, cheating. Well, ongoing research now, we're moving into the ripple regime, and uh, this is uh, the, the, the sea flow had a flow condition that was 34 times as strong as what is necessary to move the same way. This one here has uh, nine times the critical, and this one here has just a little bit more than critical. And you can see this is probably the kind of ripple uh, that you expect to see, because that's what people have seen in the past when you do experiments in a wave tank with small scale. You get see a very sharp peak type of profile. <coughs> uh, however, you can see this one is taken during operation because we can take pictures of it, we can take bottom profiles through the trans cavity. This one doesn't look very sharp peak. It looks actually nice and 
just had to show you. And so let's look first at the birth of a ripple, because we can take profiles continuously as we start the waves running, starting from the flat So here's the birth of a ripple. After about 10 periods, you get little small undulations on top. They go bigger, and then they <coughs> end up giving us a final profile after a lot of periods. So if you take the RMS wave height, excuse <coughs> me, ripple height, you can see it goes, starts low and increases with time. So the wavelength starts low and increases with time. Uh, and all I can say is that this has serious implications for linear instability theory. Because if somebody would like to make an instability theory in sediment transport, they often compare with the final steady state because that's all they know. They don't know how. They should predict the stability theory should predict this way, not yeah. this way. So uh, 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 that's, that's just one observation. But uh, of course, as Ken mentioned, first is important because Rebecca, the new claim, bailed my friend. Because she came after January 1st, so he didn't get a tax deduction. Uh, the mature ripple. Uh, these are ten ripples superimposed to form superimposed, and you can see this is the variation uh, of, the, of the shape of each individual ripple. So you can see they are highly periodic. And this is a uh, fitting of sinus and it's in the second harmonic. This one has a second harmonic that's 15%, so it's uh, a little bit non-linear, but this one here has only a 3% second harmonic, which means it is virtually sinusoidal. What else would you assume about a, a ripple that is formed when it's mature? It's sinusoidal flow. Yeah, come on, it's got to be sinusoidal. And indeed, uh, mature ripples can be quite sinusoidal and not necessarily sharp uh, uh, feet. And here's an example of three profiles going from about twice the value of critical to about ten times the value of critical. And uh, the maximum slope that we get is, uh, on this bottom, is about 30 degrees plus minus 2 degrees. Uh, which is a very nice result because uh, that allows us to if we assume they are sinusoidal, we can say tangent beta max is related to the steepness of the ripple, and we get a steepness of 0.184, which of course is beta max is 30 plus minus uh, 2 degrees, which means that uh, our observations are from 0.17 to 0.19 of the steepness. But what's interesting to note is that Pm, the angle of internal friction of sand, is of the order 28 degrees, which is very close to 30 degrees. And if you think of a bottom standing like this at an angle of internal friction, any little bird that lands on that surface is going to create a landslide. So that makes a lot of sense. So here is a new stability theory. Assume that the way uh, that the rivers are sinusoidal and that the maximum slope is equal to the internal axis of the friction angle, and you get uh, things that are in reasonable agreement <coughs> with, uh, with the final mature ripple geometry. The problem, of course, is that this takes away one problem, that I know the ratio of height and length. Now I need one of them to take advantage of this. But that's what we are trying to work on right now. We do this on the slope, and the downslope direction is here. These are the rivers you can see high inside the soil, and they are moving in the downstream direction, which is also, of course, the direction of sediment transport. We have even, I have looked at it, and I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than my collaborator, uh, Yin. Uh, but actually, when these ripples are moving down so they actually have a shape when they are on 2.6 degree slope that gives you 28 degrees relative to horizontal so they're a little bit 
upward leaning so that the axial angle with horizontal is 28 degrees, 30 degrees on the top and on the bottom, uh, which is something that I find, I find it interesting. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, the, they're moving at a constant speed. Uh, the delta z that we measure after a certain 25 wave is periodic, which suggests the moving. Uh, and we get a sediment transport like this that varies, obviously, different from crest and trough of the ripples. And we take the average of the the number of ripples, and that is our estimation of transport. And uh, we obtain, we only have two points. You need two points to make a straight line. Uh, actually, you don't, because we want it to go through 0, 0.0, so we have a free point here. But these are the results that, uh, for, for ripple bay that also show that the transport is linearly related to the slope of the bottom. Uh, <coughs> the slope of this bottom here, uh, or the constant here, is about 12.7. I showed you the other example, which was for sheet flow. For about the same amount of transport, 10.1 versus 12.7, is for the same sediment. And the big difference is that for the river, we can estimate that about 70% of the net transport is suspended load. Whereas for the sheet flow range, only about 20% for this particular case is, uh, is uh, suspended load. Suspended load is a big problem in sediment transport. And in order for us to try to use our model and develop it into uh, a model also for ripples, we need to know the flow resistance associated with the flow over the river bed to get the total systems. And <coughs> And in order to do that, we need some experiments that allows us to estimate how big the total resistance is. And we are right now incorporating that into, we have, we, we measure the pressure in the piston end and in the free open riser end. Because if the motor is identical, the open riser doesn't know what resistance is. It just keeps on going up and down the same way whether we have a flat bottom or a rip bottom. So by measuring, you can actually then show that the shear stress or equivalent shear stress you have due to a rip bottom is what you have for the flat bottom. And simply depends on the pressure that you measure over here at one point, the difference in pressure. And divided by length and multiplied by the uh, height of the sun. Uh, anyway, that allows us to predict with the pressure transducer, we had one pressure transducer that gave us quite nice results. But we want to have three so that we have uh, three, uh, we can take an average and see how bad it is or hopefully how good it is. Uh, and from that, we can get this wave friction factor. Uh, one for the flat bed experiment and one for the ripple bed experiment. And it is about 30 times bigger for the ripple experiments, which is uh, what we would expect because of the additional roughness and separation and things like that. And this is what we need to be able to, to say something about in order to further develop our sediment transport model for ripple bears and get the correct suspension. And I mentioned here FW, which is the wave friction factor, and Ken, how is it I do this? From one F sub W to another. Congratulations for 70 years and 80 days. <laughs> and for your friendship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and is that the end? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got two minutes and 36 seconds. <laughs> does, it, does anybody want to know what F sub W stands for? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, of course, it's the friction factor. You're being Wave friction factor. You're being recorded, or? <laughs> 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 this was one of the things we would talk about in the morning. Uh, uh, I don't, those of you, and you all know Ken, you have an easy time to figure out what F stands for, right? <laughs> it's a four-letter word. 
So <laughs> is, uh, if I spell correctly, I think W is also a four-letter word. So it was, uh, we basically call this F sub W, but the real thing that we wanted to say was F wit. <laughs> and those of you who saw the film, the heat, see, Ken and I never did any work together. Uh, but actually, we have been published together. Because in the movie The Heat, <coughs> Elisa McCarthy, who is the world, championship, world champion of four-letter words, uh, used our word, our invention, that we used, of course, to refer to department heads. <laughs> <laughs> she used it, and I have been watching that movie over and over again, and in the acknowledgments, and there we are not being acknowledged. <laughs> anyway. I will say a few other things later on. <laughs>